The first thing we noticed was the absence of the old Ford. That gave us the courage to push open the rusty gate and approach the house. The shades were drawn, the door was closed. No smoke rose from the chimney. I hung back, but Elizabeth ran lightly up the steps and knocked loudly. After several tries, she looked over her shoulder at me. Nobody's here, she said. Going to the window, she found a tear in the shade and peered inside. Cautiously, I joined her. The house was dark, but gradually I made out the room's shape. It was empty except for trash, old papers, broken toys, dirt and dust, a child's striped sock. Mrs. Wagner was right. The Smiths were gone. We stared at each other, lost for words. A few months ago, nothing would have made us happier. We would have been dancing in the streets to celebrate Gordy's departure. I always thought we'd see him again, Elizabeth said. Didn't you? I nodded. Together we walked around the house, taking in the peeling paint, the sagging porch, the worn steps, the grassless yard. The broken swing twisted in the breeze. Of mittens, there was no sign. I hope they'd taken the cat with them. Silently, we opened the gate, taking care to latch it behind us, and trudged home through the puddles on Davis Road. Even now, even knowing he was gone, I expected to see Gordy pedaling toward us on his rusty old bike, his black hair flying back from his face, yelling threats or insults at Elizabeth and me. We've been fighting Gordy for so long, I couldn't imagine a future without him. He'd come back, I told myself. Surely he would. Chapter 28 Several weeks later, Elizabeth and I were spending a Saturday afternoon in the trolley stop shop, sitting at the counter and sipping cherry Cokes. A group of college students was feeding nickels to the jukebox, and we were listening to the music and watching them dance. At the moment, Elizabeth was twirling round and round on her stool in time to Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. Proud that she knew all the words, she was singing along with the Andrews sisters and driving me crazy. Quit spinning, I said. You're making me dizzy. She laughed and spun so fast, the guy behind the counter told her to stop before she fell off and hurt herself. Elizabeth gave one of her sassiest looks. Before she could think of a good wisecrack, I nudged her. Look, there's Barbara, I said, pointing through the big plate glass window. On the other side of the street, Barbara was pulling Brent along the sidewalk in his red wagon. Launching herself from her stool, Elizabeth ran to the door, and I dashed after her. We hadn't seen Barbara since the day the ambulance took Stuart away. When she saw us running toward her, Barbara smiled and waved. Well, long time no see, she said. Where have you two been? Mrs. Wagner keeps us busy with so much homework. We haven't had time to do anything, Elizabeth said. Neither one of us wanted to admit that our mothers had confined us to our own yards for the past three weeks as a punishment for helping Stuart. At first, Elizabeth had been furious because my mother had told her mother what we'd done. But after a few days of sulking, she'd forgiven me. Today was our first day of freedom, and we were celebrating. Well, it's good to see you, Barbara said, and Brent clapped his hands and laughed as if he were happy too. Have you heard anything from Stuart? Elizabeth asked. Barbara smiled again. So far, I've gotten five letters, she told us. He's still in the hospital, but he's getting better every day. Are they going to ship him overseas? Elizabeth asked. They can't, Barbara said. His father broke his eardrum. You mean he's deaf? Elizabeth stared at Barbara. Just in one ear, Barbara said, but that's not enough to keep him out of combat. But that's enough to keep him out of combat. My mother told me the army will court martial Stuart, Elizabeth said. She thinks he could be executed or sent to jail. No, Barbara said. Nothing that bad will happen, Elizabeth. As soon as he's strong enough, Stu says he'll have a hearing. My dad thinks the army will take a lot of things into consideration. His family, what his father did to him, his attitude toward war. Barbara paused to remove an acorn from Brent's mouth. Where did you get that? She asked him. Dirty, dirty. Making a face, she threw it away and took a teething ring out of her pocket. Here, isn't this nice? She asked as the boy put it in his mouth and grinned. Turning back to Elizabeth and me, Barbara said, If Stu had deserted in Europe, he'd be in serious trouble. Your mother's right. You can be shot for that. But Stu went AWOL before he was sent overseas. The army could put him in jail or give him a dishonorable discharge, but I hope Dad's right and they go easy on him. I bet your folks were sore when they found out Stuart deserted, Elizabeth said. Dad was a little upset, Barbara said, but Mother claimed she knew it all along. Elizabeth whistled, and I knew she was thinking about the hairbrush her mother had used on her rear end when she heard about Stuart and us. Sometimes you start to feel the killing just has to stop, Barbara said. You don't want anyone else to go to war, especially someone like Stu. There was a little silence. I was thinking about Jimmy, and it must have showed in my face because Barbara put her arm around me and gave me a hug. 
We'll all miss Jimmy, she whispered. College Hill won't be the same without him and Butch and Harold. With the wind tugging gently at our clothes and hair, we walked quietly down the path beside the trolley tracks. The March sun was warm, and the Vesithia bloomed like spilled gold in front lawns. Elizabeth balanced on the narrow tracks while Brent watched, laughing at her wavering steps and outspread arms. I walked beside Barbara, my head tilted back, looking up at the small white clouds scudding across the sky. They reminded me of a flock of sheep driven home by the wind. What about Dumbo Gordy? Elizabeth asked after a while. She teetered for a moment and concentrated on regaining her balance as if she were more interested in walking the rail than hearing the answer to her own question. But she didn't fool me. Even though Elizabeth wouldn't admit it, not even to me, I knew she missed him. According to Stu, Cordy's having a great time at his grandmother's house, Barbara said. Best of all, Mr. Smith's gone out to California looking for work. Stu doesn't think he'll be back. We were almost at Garfield Road when Barbara stopped and looked at us. Can you two keep a secret? She asked. You can't tell anyone. Not yet. I haven't even told my parents. Solemnly, Elizabeth and I crossed our hearts and hoped to die if we ever revealed a word of what Barbara was about to say. Girl Scout's honor, I added for good measure. Stu asked me to marry him, Barbara said. While I stared open mouth, Elizabeth leapt off the trolley track and hugged Barbara as hard as she could. Turning to me, Elizabeth grabbed my hands, jumped up and down, and whirled me round and round. I knew it! I knew it! She shouted. After a few more leaps, Elizabeth let go of me and seized Barbara's arm. When's the wedding? Is it soon? Not till next winter, Barbara said. It depends on the war and what the army decides to do with Stu. Margaret and I will be your bridesmaids, Elizabeth told Barbara, and Gordy can be the ring bearer. What a wedding that would be. Barbara threw back her head and laughed. The March sun caught the red in her hair and made it shine. Then, her face serious, she said, you only get one wedding like that, kids, and I've already had mine. This time, Stu and I are going to the county courthouse, but I'll make sure you know all about it. If you hadn't dragged me down to the woods last winter, who knows what would have happened to Stu. We watched Barbara walk away, the wagon bouncing along behind her. Before she disappeared around a corner, Brent looked back at us. Bye-bye, bye-bye, he called. We go, we go. We waved to him and Barbara and then kind of swooned against each other. It was exciting to know we've been involved in a big romance. Even helped it happen. Elizabeth punched me lightly on the shoulder. Didn't I tell you she was in love with him? I grinned and nodded my head. You were right, as usual, I admitted. I always am, Elizabeth said, running ahead. She shouted, step on a crack, break Hitler's back. Step on a crack, break Hitler's back. Over our heads, tiny red buds softened the maple's bare branches. A robin, the first one I'd seen, hopped across Mr. Zimmerman's lawn, and two squirrels darted round and round the trunk of a tree, as if they were playing a game of tag. It was almost spring, and we were beating the Nazis. Soon, it would all be over, both in Europe and in Japan. No more bombs, no more bullets, no more killing. Barbara would marry Stuart, and we'd all be happy again. For a moment, I imagined our family riding in the brand new car, heading toward Ocean City. Daddy driving, mother reading the map, Jimmy and me in the back seat. Shocked at myself for forgetting, I stood still, my eyes shut, and forced myself to remember. Jimmy wasn't coming back. Forever and always, there would be just three of us, mother, daddy, and me. There might be a car, there might be a trip to Ocean City, but there would be no brother to call me funny names or make me laugh. Never, never, never. My eyes filled with tears and I stumbled on an uneven place in the sidewalk as I walked slowly down Garfield Road. Already halfway home, Elizabeth whirled around to look at me. Her hair spilled over her eyes. Her pea coat hung open, its last button dangling on a thread. And her overalls had a big hole in one knee. Come on, slow poke, she shouted. Step on a crack. It had been a long time since I believed our game would hurt Hitler and bring Jimmy home safely. But to please her, I yelled, break Hitler's back and stamp the sidewalks hard the way I used to. Elizabeth watched me run toward her. The wind had dried my tears, but from the way she grabbed my hand, she must have known I was feeling sad. For a moment, we stared into each other's eyes. Lots of things had changed since the war started, but not us. Linking my little finger with hers, I smiled at Elizabeth. Forever and always, I said, no matter what happens, we'll be best friends. Together, we walked the rest of the way home.